Former Ambassador Nikki Haley joins me now. Ambassador Haley, welcome back to Meet the Press. It's great to be with you. Well, it is great to have you here on set. So let's dive in. We are just a few days away from Super Tuesday. You have yet to win a state. I wonder if you can take me inside your thoughts as you're out there on the campaign trail asking people to vote for you. Do you still believe you can win the nomination? I think that you can go and look at any of our events and see thousands of people showing up because they want something new. I think the part that that a lot of the pundits don't understand is this isn't an anti-Trump movement, which is what they continue to. I'm not anti-Trump. This is about the fact that people want someone who they can vote for. Mm -hmm. They want to go for someone who does believe in fiscal discipline and reducing the size of government. They do want someone who believes in peace through strength and national security. They want someone who's going to pay attention to the next generation and not focus on division and hatred. They want someone who's going to focus on solutions and results and give people hope in the American dream again. That's really the focus of who all of these people are. And so what we're doing is trying to give them that voice as we push into Super Tuesday. And I know you've done the math. You know how uphill your battle is. Do you still think you have a shot at the nomination or is it slipping away, Ambassador? No, I think we push hard. I think we fight. You're going to have 16 states and territories that are voting on Tuesday. And so a lot of people's voices are going to be heard. And that's what this has all been about. You've only had three or four states that have voted up until now. We're a big country and we want everybody to feel like they had the opportunity to vote for someone and not just against someone. And I think that's the biggest thing we hear is people are so desperate for normal. And that's what we want to give them is normal. Let's talk about Super Tuesday. Mm -hmm. If you wake up on Wednesday and you haven't won anywhere, and that's an if, would you then need to make the decision that it's time to drop out of the race? I've always said this needs to be competitive. As long as we are competitive, as long as we are showing that there is a place for us, I'm going to continue to fight. That's always been the case. Would you see yourself as competitive if you didn't win on Super Tuesday any state? Well, usually y'all are the ones that decide what's competitive and what's not. So, you know, y'all decided whether I was competitive in Iowa or New Hampshire or South Carolina. So we're going to continue to just keep pushing through. I don't look too far ahead. I look at what do the American people want? If 70 percent of Americans say they don't want Donald Trump or Joe Biden, that's not a small number. If 30 to 40 percent of all these early states have said they want to vote for the direction of where we want to take the country, that's not a small number. And so that's why we continue to push forward. But would it be tough for you to make the argument to stay in this race if you don't win anywhere on Super Tuesday? Well, first, let's see what happens on Super Tuesday. I don't like to look at what ifs or hypotheticals. I think we always have to live in the moment. They didn't think we'd make it to Iowa and we came one percent from second. They didn't. They said we were going to be 30 points down in New Hampshire. Sure, we got 43 percent. They didn't think that it would be between me and Trump in the end, and it is. So I think we just keep going and looking and saying, what else can we do? How many more people can we touch? And what message can we continue to give? Based on what you're saying, Ambassador, are you prepared to stay in this through the convention? Is that your plan? If the people want to see me go forward, they'll show it. They'll show it in their votes. They'll show it in their donations. They'll show it in the fact that they want us to continue to go forward. This is about really trying to get everyone to realize that this primary isn't between Donald Trump and Nikki Haley. Yes, on the ballot, that's what you see. This primary is what is the direction of the Republican Party? Are we going to go where you had Donald Trump, he grew government, he didn't reduce the size of government, he put us $8 trillion in debt in just four years, more than any other president, and you're seeing a Republican Party follow him into that wasteful spending, not talking about fiscal discipline. This is about Donald Trump, who believes that you should be more of an isolationist, that America doesn't need friends. That's his focus. My focus is we need to start respecting taxpayer dollars. We need to reduce the size of government. We need to put those resources more in the hands of the people. We need to start focusing on getting our kids reading again. We need to secure our borders and be a country of law and order. And we believe in peace through strength, which means our focus is to prevent war. That's two very different Republican parties. You're laying this out in very stark terms. It, it sounds like from your perspective, this is the a battle for the Republican Party. You've been sharpening your attacks against 
former President Trump, everyone has noticed in recent days, in recent weeks. Have you taken the prospect, the possibility of endorsing him off the table at this point? It's not anything I think about. What I have but said is it is off the table, Ambassador? It sounds like you are in a different place. Are people misinterpreting what you're saying? Have you moved to a place where you're no longer planning to endorse him? Well, I think, first of all, you're, if you talk about an endorsement, you're talking about a loss. I don't think like that. When you're in a race, you don't think about losing. You think about continuing to go forward. What I can tell you is I don't think Donald Trump or Joe Biden should be president. I don't think that we need two candidates in their 80s. I don't think we want a Joe Biden who calls his opponents fascists or a Donald Trump who calls his opponents vermin. No one wants that. I think people want a new generational leader that is going to go back to what the American dream is, what we want for our kids in a place that's something that we can be proud of again. Given that we are so close to Super Tuesday, don't voters deserve to know where you stand on this very fundamental question of whether, if ultimately you do not win at the end of the day, would you support Donald Trump, given that you are saying this is a battle, it sounds like, for the Republican Party? Well, when y'all ask Donald Trump if he would support me, then I will talk about that. But right now, my focus is how do we touch as many voters? How do we win? I want the American people to see that you don't have to live this way. There is a path forward, and we can do it with someone who can put in eight years that can constantly focus on results and not the negativity and the baggage that we have right now. Let me try it this way. You did sign a pledge, an RNC pledge, yeah. to support the eventual nominee. Do you still feel bound by that pledge? I have always said that I have serious concerns about Donald Trump. I have even more concerns about Joe Biden. So is that a no? Are you bound by the RNC pledge? I the RNC pledge, I mean, at the time of the debate, we had to take it to where would you support the nominee? And you had to, in order to get on that debate stage, you said yes. The RNC is now not the same RNC. Now it's So you're no Trump's longer bound by that pledge? No, I think I'll make what decision I want to make, but that's not something I'm thinking about. And I think that while y'all think about that, I'm looking at the fact that we had thousands of people in Virginia. We're headed to North Carolina. We're going to continue to go to Vermont and Maine and all these states to go and show people that there is a path forward. And so I don't look at what ifs. I look at how do we continue the conversation? You know, it's interesting. Chris Christie said he was asked why he didn't endorse you when he dropped out. He said because he thought you would endorse Donald Trump. But it sounds like what you're saying is that you're leaning against endorsing Donald Trump. Can you just put a little bit of clarity? Are you leaning against endorsing Donald Trump at this point? I truly am not thinking about any of that. And, you know, I mean, look, there's a you're not taking it off the table. There's a Fair huge to difference between me and Chris Christie. Chris Christie ran because he just didn't want Trump. Mm -hmm. I am running because it's not about Trump. I voted for him twice. I was proud to serve America in his administration. This is not a never Trump movement. This is the fact that I see America going into a bad direction, one that's going off a fiscal cliff, one where our kids don't think they're ever going to be able to afford a home, one where we've got only 31 percent of eighth graders in our country reading, one where we have a ridiculously open border, and one where we're about to fall into war if we don't go forward. I think that's dangerous. I think that's not what Americans want. And that's what I'm trying to say is we need to stop this direction and go in a new direction where we can be safe and healthy, economic freedom, freedom of all types, so that we can have Americans that feel like they have a government working for them again. All right. I want to ask you about January 6th. that has been in the headlines again because the Supreme Court has now said it is going to take up the immunity case as it relates to former President Trump. As you may recall, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, who said he's now leaving his leadership post, said that Donald Trump was, quote, practically and morally responsible for January 6th for the attack on the Capitol. Without weighing into the legality, do you agree with Mitch McConnell? Was Donald Trump practically and morally responsible? Well, first of all, I think if you look at what happened on January 6th, I have said it was a terrible day. It is not a beautiful day. But I've also, you know, I look at the fact that you had a lot of Americans going out there doing what we're blessed in this country to do, freedom of speech, freedom to say what they want to say. What went terribly wrong is the fact that we saw complete lawlessness going into the Capitol. And what Trump's role is, is not that he had the rally in the first place. That's what we do in America. 
The problem is when he had the opportunity to stop it. You know, you have everybody from Fox News anchors to friends to family begging him to say something to get them to stop, including his vice president. And he was silent. So and he didn't say anything. So it was like, why did you allow it to happen? Because when a leader sees something that goes wrong, you use the power of your voice to make it right. That's what the question is. Where was he? Why didn't he do it? Those are the questions he's going to have to answer. So, Ambassador, just going back to my question, yes or no, is he practically and morally responsible, as Mitch McConnell We're going to find out. But do you think he is? What do you think? You're right. I think he should have said something earlier. I think he should have stopped it when it started. Is that I a think yes? he should have. It's it's what I'm saying. I am telling you, having the rally was not a crime to turn around and not stop people from breaking the law when he had the opportunity to do that is questionable. And that's what I think the courts are going to have to play with and figure out how they're going to do it. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not going to try and play in that. I've told you what I think in terms of the fact that any time there is lawlessness, yeah. And you condone lawlessness and you don't do anything to stop lawlessness. He's going to have to answer for that. Again, I'm not asking you legally, just just very clear to put a fine point on it, because it sounds like you're saying he does bear some moral and practical responsibility. I've said, Is that accurate? I've said this very clearly. You're trying to ask the same question in a different way. What I am saying is he has to answer for why he didn't do more to stop it. Do you think Donald Trump would follow the Constitution if he were elected to a second term? I don't know. I don't I don't know. I mean, I, you always want to think someone will. But I don't know. You know, when you when you go in and you talk about revenge, when you go and you talk about, you know, vindication, when you go and you talk about what does that mean? Like, I don't know what that means. And only he can answer for that. What I can answer for is I don't think there should ever be a president that's above the law. I don't think that there should ever be a president that has total immunity to do whatever they want to do. I think that we need to have someone that our kids can look up to, that they can be proud of. And I think we need to have a country of law and order, a country of freedom, and a country that goes back to respecting the value of a taxpayer dollar. And we don't have any of that right now. What does it say about the state of the Republican Party that you're saying that you don't know if the GOP frontrunner will follow the Constitution? Because I'm saying that's not the Republican Party. That is Donald Trump. If that is in question, that is for the voters to decide. What I am saying is, I think we deserve better. Americans deserve better. We can't say that our only options are Joe Biden and Donald Trump. We can't. Two guys in their 80s, two guys that continue to put this division between America, two guys who haven't talked about a vision for the future. All they do is talk about each other in the past. That's the problem. You've seen the turnout, the results in these early voting states. The majority of voters are voting for Donald Trump. Do you still feel at home in the Republican Party, given what you're saying? I am a Republican, and I know that there are thousands of people showing up at our events that are Republicans that do believe, <laughs> unlike Donald Trump, in fiscal responsibility, that do believe in lim limited government, unlike Donald Trump, that do believe that we should stand with our allies in peace through strength, and that do believe that you can't go and call names and say things and blast against the bureaucracy and do all these things to cause this anger and, and think that there's a better way forward. And I think that's, that's what I'm trying to issue. Let's talk about the big domestic headline this week, uh, IVF. This past week, a single Republican lawmaker blocked legislation that would have created federal protections for IVF access nationwide. Cindy Hyde-Smith, who blocked the bill, said it was, quote, vast overreach. Do you support federal protections for IVF? What I support is that we make sure that every parent has the right to have those fertility processes. I had my two children through fertility. I want every parent who wants that blessing to be able to have that, and government shouldn't do anything to stop it. So should there be federal protections for people for IVF? I think there should be protections for the embryos so that parents feel like they're protected and respected. But I think the conversation of what happens with those embryos has to be between the parents and the physician. 
period. We don't need to go and create a bunch of laws for something when we don't have a problem. There is not a problem in terms of what is happening. So we shouldn't have government create one. This is this is not a hard thing. When parents decide they want to have a baby and they can't, mm -hmm. the blessing that, that Michael and I had to be able to go through the fertility processes to have our yeah. babies was a personal one yeah. that we wanted to have just with our doctor. We don't yeah. want to have that conversation with government. You're saying that the decision should be between parents and the physician, no one else. Why doesn't that same standard apply to an abortion, for example? Well, what I've said is it, this should be in the hands of the people for the people to decide. They should decide whether their states are gonna be pro-life or pro-choice. They should decide whether their states are gonna be IVF or not IVF. I personally think we want as many fertility options for people as they can. That's my opinion. It, but other states may decide something different. Alabama was going in one direction. I don't think that's a direction you want to go. The same way I don't think that the conversations that people have been having on abortion are good conversations. They divide people instead of bringing people together. And I think these need to be handled with respect and humanizing these situations instead of demonizing you, them. You have said embryos are babies. It sounds like you don't want the government involved when it comes to IVF, but you do when it comes to abortion. My personal opinions is that embryos are babies. Somebody else's may be different. I treated the way Michael and I looked at it was we always looked at it that way. But everybody looks at this differently. And you are looking at a situation where, one, you're not talking about masses of embryos. But two, you've got to talk with your doctor about what's viable and what's not. It's a very technical process that you can't just blanket a law around. Well, and that's why I just want to get the bottom line here, because as you rightfully say, IVF is a process in which right. embryos are sometimes destroyed or donated. Do you support IVF as it is practiced in the United States? Yes, of course. And should there be federal protections for that? Yes, to make sure that IVF is there, to make sure that parents have it, all of that. But keep in mind, too, even when you're talking about the issue of abortion, and I don't think the fellows have talked about it well at all, we have to go back to what it is it that we want. We all want to say, how do we save as many babies as possible and support as many moms as possible? That's why I've said with a federal law, rather than going in and demonizing this issue, let's find consensus and say, why can't we come together on banning late-term abortions? Why can't we come together on encouraging adoptions? Why can't we come together on saying doctors and nurses who don't believe in abortion shouldn't have to perform them? Why can't we come together and say contraception should be accessible? And why can't we come together and say no state can tell a woman who's had an abortion she's going to jail or getting the death penalty. Why don't we just start is, there? Is consensus realistic, though? This is an issue that's been debated for over 50 years. Is that realistic consensus? Consensus is available when you tell the American people the truth. The American people have been told to have options that aren't realistic. You can't get consensus unless you have a majority of the House, 60 Senate yeah. votes, and a signature of a president. That's not going to happen without consensus. All right, let me turn to foreign policy quickly. Senator Lindsey Graham has taken up Donald Trump's position that he wants to support war aid to Ukraine only if it's in the form of a loan. Is that something you would support? I think we need to give them the equipment and ammunition they need to win. Is a loan appropriate? I mean, you can do a loan if you want, but if that's like taking away the situation, what you should be looking at is Putin has been very clear. Once he takes Ukraine, he's not going to stop. Poland and the Baltics are next. Look at what's happening with Moldova now. That, those are NATO countries, not Moldova, but the others. Those are NATO countries. That puts America at war. This is about preventing war. If we don't work with our allies to give them the equipment and ammunition to win, if Ukraine falls, Russia will go further, and that puts America at war. So this isn't about a loan. Give them the equipment and ammunition they need to win. And let's put this to bed. Biden was too slow in the process. And now Republicans are trying to play footsie with it. This is not something to play footsie with. This is about protecting Americans. 
Finally, you have knocked down the prospects of running as a third party candidate. Can you just definitively say here and now, are you ruling out running as a third party Absolutely. candidate? Absolutely. I've said that over and over again. I've ruled out everything anybody could possibly say. I'm doing this because I think we have a country to save. I'm doing this for my kids and I'm doing this for your kids and everybody else's because they deserve to know what the American dream feels like, what hope feels like. If you look at the fact they went through COVID and they've gone through all this division and they don't think they're going to be able to find, afford a home or be able to make ends meet, we have to show them that there is a path. And right now they don't feel that. And we owe that to them. Ambassador, just finally, looking forward, if you don't win the Republican nomination, do you see a future for yourself in politics still? This has never been about my political career. But how do you if see it was your from, future? If this was about my political career, I would have gotten out a long time ago. Yeah. This is about the fact that God has given us one life. And that one life is to go make as much of a difference as you possibly can. I want people to know that America is better than this. I want people to know that we have an amazing ability to self-correct if we decide to be a part of the solution. I want people to know that we could have an America where we sit down and have dinner and not have fighting. We could have an America where people can go to work and say what they want and not be demoted. We could have an America where we could strongly disagree and not have to hate each other. That is in our reach. But Americans have to decide if they want it. In a general election, you're given a choice. In a primary, we make our choice. On Super Tuesday, a lot of people are going to be making their choices. I hope their choice is for the America we know and love, and I hope their choice is for freedom, because that's what I'm fighting for. All right. Ambassador Nikki Haley, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for answering all my questions. So really appreciate it. Of course. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.